Um, okay, so I wanted to ask you about your influences. I think my influences are wide and varied. Uh -huh. When I think back to my childhood, then probably my dad was my first influence. And probably I had no influences at all. When I was young, I just used to draw around my hands, draw little faces on hats. Um, but there was things that I saw that probably influenced me. And one was the cupboard that was in the bathroom. It was like a wooden corner cabinet and it had a sort of sea, some kind of seascape on it. Whatever it was, it was evocative and I liked mm. that, that feeling of looking at the picture and, and evoking this, it was almost like some kind of eroded tree on a beach. But a lot of the paint had actually come off and I quite liked that. So that was an influence on me thinking back, as well as these uh, little faces that my dad made out of window putty in the cow shed because I grew up on a farm mm -hmm. and when he was putting some new windows into the cow shed there was some putty left over and he shaped these three little faces onto the wall of the cow shed and they were there they were there just for years and years and years and I always used to look at those and find them very interesting mm -hmm. these weird little putty faces I think with a couple of inches <laughs> yeah across. that was it that was it. you were imagining the exact right size there <laughs> that was how big they were wow um in the cow shed and probably my yeah my dad he was a musician and a and also a craftsman he used to turn spoons on the this really old victorian lathe oh. that was terribly scary i mean i used to use it but it it, it did used to frighten me quite a lot <laughs> when you saw switch the switch and it, like this big drive belt going round that, that probably would have flayed you alive if you got too close and that was up in the oast if you don't know what oast house it's a, a building for drying hops very kentish and, yes was it around kentish. here where was it well, it was farm. it was in Tenterden oh, where lovely. I grew up on a farm so I was probably always influenced by the wood the, the, the aspect of making things out of wood mm -hmm. that my dad was always making things out of wood and, we were, and we'd go wood cutting and my dad and his helpers would be cutting down the trees and I'd be there with a knife or some kind of billy which was a, a bill hooked machete mm -hmm. which is the, you know the general tool that was lying about that right. we used to use to sort of take the small branches yeah. off the side of the trees but I obviously used those to try and sculpt some kind of horse or something yeah. like that but the, the one that I do remember is trying to sculpt a horse and chopping my thumb <sighs> yeah with this <laughs> with this machete and uh, I remember the guy one of the woodcutters like tearing this strip out of his jacket and then wrapping it around my oh. thumb and he said you better go home now so <laughs> I went home and said to my mum oh, I think I've hurt myself but I, can't, I don't think anyone did much about it I think it just healed up <laughs> over time <laughs> Um, so those were sort of general early influences of, of making things out of trees, mm -hmm. whistles, just anything really to amuse myself. And then when I was at school, we didn't really get taught about artists at all. It, generally at the beginning of term, I would be given a sheet of 12 different topics. Mm -hmm. It would be like journey to the moon, a uh, picnic by the seaside things like that and then and then every week you'd come in you'd look down the list and then you draw a picture to do with that that thing it was yeah it was uh, I'm not sure it was the best GCSE course I've ever done <laughs> oh really um but later but after that I went to sixth form college when I did a level art that was you know with that's when we got introduced to artists and we had a really brilliant art history teacher called Vera Brumby and she was on some kind of art quiz show and right. she did she did win it yeah very knowledgeable lady and so this is where we learned about all the different artists I suppose the people that I most connected with was probably impressionism mm -hmm. expressionists um, Picasso this is the 19th 20th century art mm -hmm. and then when I went to art college, Maidstone Art College, I was probably influenced by the people around me, you know, other people that were on the course mm -hmm. that I talked to, my tutors, specifically the course leader, it, whose name was Manuel Jones. And uh, he became a very good friend of mine. 
and sadly he's not with us anymore but he was a great influence on me and my ideas and we'd always spend a lot I'd go and visit him in Wales mm-hmm. and we'd spend a lot of time out and about drawing and making things and making huge sculptures on the beach or painting faces on stones or just doing mad things like flattening it one day Mahaniel had, had got this giant box of cutlery he bought from a boot fair and we started just putting these spoons into the fire we had a little you know like a lovely little cottage near the coast in Wales and yeah he was an artist there so you know I think that during my during my degree course he actually left left the course so he wasn't there on the last year but after that I did keep in touch with him and you know we became very good friends and we used to just go and talk for hours and hours about art but anyway we, we stuck these spoons into the fire and let them go red hot and then hammered them out flat and it's just just we used to just do things like that and then we made like books out of slate and just experimented in, right. in a wacky kind of way yeah, I good. think we both had a similar sense of humour when it came to to art uh-huh. um, and then of course the influences don't, don't stop do they no. I remember going travelling for uh, six months and travelled around the world and just saw so many different kinds of art and especially when I went to America a lot of Native American art mm-hmm. and it reaffirms what you're interested in when you when you see things that are carving, car- things carved out of wood or different styles you know, in the same way, I used to spend a huge amount of time wandering around the museums of London, and I used to love the Museum of Mankind, which was the ethnographic part of the British Museum, mm-hmm. and uh, sadly it's no longer there. But there was always very interesting exhibitions there. I used to love, there was one that was on for a long time, which was about the Mexican Day of the Dead, mm. and I always liked the kind of humour that was within that particular exhibition and all of those things just so you soak them all up don't you yeah, yeah, and then yeah. whatever uh, you know what 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 I am now and what I do now I think I can trace everything back to childhood and I've always kind of been the same but um I suppose you get get better at knowing yourself mm-hmm. don't you? hopefully <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, what are people's reactions when they see your work? What's the what's the most common thing people say when they see it? Your your <laughs> paintings and your kind of wooden people are creatures. normally yeah people normally are complimentary to my face. I'm not sure what they say behind <laughs> behind my back. <laughs> um, but yeah, people like it. I think they think it's uh, a bit mad in a good way. Mm-hmm. I like the I like the reaction of small children. Usually, you know, if I've got an exhibition somewhere and it's a window, and sometimes you see small children looking at the hedgehogs or mm-hmm. some kind of wacky animal that I've made and pointing. I think that's quite quite nice that yeah. my artwork can appeal to a broad age range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I think that's true. It goes from being decorative and then it goes all the way up to, to being fine art, doesn't it? It's that's quite a tricky thing to do. I suppose I'm trying to trying to get a sense of a place, but also sometimes humour or sometimes mm-hmm. ideas, mm-hmm. Uh, some kind of idea that you've had, or sometimes there's some subtle element of symbolism within the picture. So I suppose that is all my influences, my interests, mm-hmm. sort of trying to find themselves into something that has got some kind of thread that holds it together. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that interesting. That that brings me on to one of the questions I wrote about how would you describe yourself? Illustration or fine art or or not at all? Do you not think of? I think I'm a rough artist who also does a bit of illustration. Right. But my the course, my degree course was very much a fine art illustration course. So I'm probably straddling that line a little bit right. in, uh, when you see it because there's. I quite like a narrative within a picture, uh-huh. but then it's not quite an illustration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we don't need to label. People like to label us, don't they? But we don't need to 
I float from being a photographer to being a filmmaker to being a painter daily, hourly. So, uh, I think I'm just a creative person, yeah. and and all that creativity comes out in different ways, doesn't yeah. it? Sometimes it might be a song, or it, yeah, it might true. be a bit of writing, or a play, or a painting, or a sculpture, or something random, like flattening a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you, some of your paintings are from different places, aren't they? Different series of, of and, 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 I mean, the blue... Oh. Oh. <laughs> we end this podcast <laughs> very suddenly. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I don't know how to put this to you, listener. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it's, bird it's a bird scare, right? Yeah. yeah. It was a... Uh, it's also a dance scare. Um, I forgot what my question was. It was going to be a really brainy and academic question. Um, oh no, sorry, I was talking about, so your different um, kind of almost collections, would you say? or, or Definitely themes? collections, yes. Yeah. The, blue, the blue stuff going on with wood creatures, underwater creatures, and also paintings at the moment. It's like a, yes. could you call that an aqua blue yes. period? It's an aqua blue period, yeah. yes. Well, it, it came about because I was in the studio and uh, a few summers ago, I bought a, a glass fishing float. Wow. And it was blue, big blue glass fishing float, the kind that you see in touristy shops in Cornwall and Devon. And I got this hanging in the window and I was just looking through it and I thought, oh, this looks lovely. I like looking through this blue glass at the world. And, and then it just occurred to me that I've just had to do... A, a lot of blue things and maybe it's a bit obvious that it was about the seaside but then I did make that connection to uh, summer holidays spent at Lyd on Sea and suddenly all of these memories came back of these holidays that we used to spend or at the coast I, d I suppose I didn't really think about it but my but but we used to rent a bungalow at Lyd on Sea every year and every year uh, we'd stay with my grandparents my aunt Joan and my parents would go back every morning and every evening to do the farm chores and milk the cows so it wasn't exactly a holiday for them <laughs> no um, but I've got lots of memories of wandering up and down the beaches beach combing and getting lost generally but it was you know the 70s and 80s and no one really cared if you just wandered off by yourself no. And um, so that recent collection is all to do with those memories that I had. Do you purposely use kind of recycled materials, or is that you know is that a conscious decision, or is that just a, for because they look incredible because they've had this history already? That's what I like about recycled materials, even if I went out to a shop and bought the same uh, you know a plank of wood and painted on that I like something that's probably going to get thrown away so if I do wander up and, the, up and down the road and I see a skip with a nice piece of wood in there I'll hook it out and, and I'll use that because I don't I hate to see waste mm. I've come from a make do and mend family mm -hmm. and because I lived on a farm we weren't near the shops or anything. You just made things with what you had. It's like you'd find an old log. When I used to make things on the lathe, I'd just pick a log out of the log basket and brad all the holes at the either end and put a bit of beeswax on and bang it onto the lathe and use that. So I just use, I like using what I can find, mm -hmm. but it's not just that. It's the fact that I like things that are aged things mm -hmm. that have gone a bit rusty or they've got a bit dented I like things that are like you say have a history to mm -hmm. them already and, and it's a way of stopping them from just going to landfill yeah 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 and turning into turning something into art is, is a good use of something so you would you say even if you did buy or pulled a really nice clean bit of wood out of a skip 
I'll still drop it on the bound, ground and stamp on it. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, and, you know, get a rasp to it, oh. get a saw to it and, and just rough it up. I like that point of it being rough, but not so rough as to get a splinter. I mean, <laughs> I will take the splinters off. <laughs> so I don't want that to be hazardous. And it's even like that when you're doing the painting. I never want to refine things too much because I always tend to ruin things if I make them too clean and refined. Mm -hmm. It goes, it all goes back to the old cupboard that I like to see something that you can't exactly tell mm -hmm. what it is sometimes. There's that sort of element of abstraction, but at the same time, I want to sort of know what something's roughly about, mm -hmm. but I want it I want there to be an area for interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, so, growing up in Kent, has that been any influence, the landscapes around here? Growing up in Kent, I was entirely left to my own devices just to do my own things and grow up on a farm. I just did utterly mad things that I look back on now and think, how did I actually survive? I mean, I used to climb up inside the giant barns hand over hand across the kind of inner pipework, rusty pipework structure <laughs> of the barns, across muck spreader blades and things like that. And, <laughs> and I think if I had my parents had actually seen me do this, you know, they probably would have been horrified. Yeah. Or I, just the things that I did, because it was the 1970s. <laughs> I generally injured myself quite a lot, I uh -huh. think, but um, survived to tell the tale. But yeah, I was just left to my own devices. And of course, uh, being surrounded by the farm, uh, that's going to be an influence on you. I suppose mm -hmm. it made me quite a solitary person who's very good at entertaining oneself. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing. You know, we grew up in a time without, without computers and social medias and being connected and all that stuff. So do you think we had a better chance at building imagination because there was no distractions, we had to be more imaginative? I think it's very easy to get drawn in to all that the internet has to offer. And even when I was growing up, people had those little Donkey Kongs and yeah, 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 Pac course. Man. I remember even at that time, people being very, very into like playing their little computer games. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had a ZX Spectrum. Yeah, me and too. And I spent years and, yeah, I mean, several years just programming the ZX Spectrum and that was all I was into, making my own programs. But again, I was, yeah, I did play the ZX Spectrum games, but a lot of the time I was still trying to be creative uh -huh. and I was still writing my own adventure games and drawing all the little pictures and uh -huh. there used to be uh, an adventure writing software and it was called the Quill and uh, there was another package that went with it and it was called the Illustrator and you could write your own Dungeons and Dragons mm, style yeah. adventure game and that's wow. I spent a lot of time doing that so I think whatever whatever's around you you can still be creative mm -hmm. with it it all depends what you do with mm. the resources that you have it's been a tricky year I suppose obviously for everybody but what are you looking forward to opening up? You've had some galleries come and see you or come and write to you, get in touch. What do you, what do you see yourself doing next? Doing more art. Yeah. I think Instagram is very good at connecting people. Mm -hmm. That is what I've discovered this year. So I've made more contacts with other artists, other people that are interested in art. For me, I'm going to see where it goes. Hmm. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, thank you. That's nice. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs>